Well, good morning, New Hope. Um, good to be with you today. Uh, the worship was, it just sort of caught me off guard. I, just listening to you guys sing. In fact, there's, there's several of the songs I never, I just don't know them, but they were easy enough to sing on. The second one, I'm Irish to the core. In fact, I'm going to Ireland on behalf of Big Life at the end of August, and whatever that second song was, felt like it had a Celtic feel to it. But it was so good to to just to hear the voices. It's so good to look out and see so many people I recognize. But by the way, I recognize some of you before you recognized me. Because I got old. That, that, that's just the reality. Like, I think that guy, nah, couldn't be. Yeah. Anyway, I've been in Traverse City for 34 years now. And uh, I remember Pastor Dave back when he was at Bayview Wesleyan. That was when we were like riding dinosaurs or something. But... Um, so I've been around for a long time, and I have to say that um, one of the joys of being here is uh, I have, in my lifetime, I have never seen a time where walls are coming down, not only between local churches, but even global ministries. Like when I go to Ireland, on behalf of Big Life, we're looking for what we call persons of peace, local nationals, as Bob said, that we can train. In fact, if you've never heard of Big Life, I'll get more into that later, but um, their mission is to empower local believers. Same thing here in Traverse City, because the best people to reach people who live in Traverse City are who? Not, not people from you know, Africa or, or Asia. It, you, you guys know the language, you know the customs, you know Cherry Festival, you know how to avoid the, you know all that stuff. So, so, um, so but when I go to Ireland, we're going to be partnering with another disciple-making ministry called E3. I have never seen a time in my life where believers and followers of Jesus are letting down the walls and coming together for the greater work of the kingdom of God. So on behalf of uh, a big life. I, I want to say thank you to Pastor Craig for trusting me to come and share with you, and thank you for your, your warm and gracious welcome this morning. I, I oft, also have to say that the, the slide that came up about, like, like a come for six consecutive times, like if this is your first time and I'm speaking, do you know the pressure I feel? <laughs> Holy cow. No, I'm, I'm kidding. But I do hope that you'll come back, because I think that's really good. If you're exploring a relationship with God, if you're wondering about a local church, I, I think it does take a little while uh, to avoid snap judgments and come and, and uh, see if this could be a place that you could call home. Let me, let me pray, and then I want to dive into the message. So, in fact, Lord, I, I just want to pray a scripture. The psalmist said, Lord, may the words of my mouth and then the meditation of our hearts, the things that we think about in these next few minutes, may they be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody agreed, said? Amen. Amen. So I want to kind of give you a, like a bias that I'm coming with, and, and it's this. Um, in fact, I'm, I'm going to ask you to bring up that first slide. And, and it says this. Every person in this room wants to live a big life. I think the slide's going to come eventually. Maybe not. I'll just say it. Every person in this room wants to live a big life and make a positive difference in the world. Okay, there it is. Now, uh, you, may, you, you may be saying, yeah, nah, that's overstated. I just want to kind of cruise. I just want to get by until I die and go to heaven. Uh, may, you know, if that's where you're at, I would say, I don't buy it. Maybe you got the dreams beat out of you. Maybe you had high aspirations to make a difference in the world and somehow you got bruised and beat up and discouraged. But I believe deep down on our best day, we want to make a difference in the world, don't we? Don't we? I don't want to just take up my two-by-two two piece of real estate, suck up some wind, and then die. I, I, and I don't think you do either. If you are a follower of Jesus, and I'm not assuming that everybody in this room, or those who might be, by, by the way, I should say hello to those who are watching via live stream. Um, I know Pastor Craig was in Poland. You, I'm going to talk about the Czech Republic, but he was in Poland um, earlier and other places. So there may be people from Eastern Europe watching, or Bel Air, or wherever, so... We love you guys. Thanks for watching. But if you're a follower of Jesus, you might say it like this. I want to live a big life. That's why I called the message Live Big. You might say, I want to live a big life, and I want to make a big kingdom impact. And if that's you, my response is, me too. In fact, that's, that's why 
that's why, I, I don't know if it's tr exactly true, it's why I got into ministry. Ministry is its own kind of deal. I, I sort of stumbled into pastoral ministry. What did I know about being a pastor? I was just this Catholic, Irish Catholic boy who got his bell rung by the gospel in high school. I, I, I was never on a, all I knew about ministry was being a priest, and I liked girls, and I knew that wasn't going to work. <laughs> but, but, I, but, I, but I gave my life to Jesus, and as I, God began to pull me into ministry, I, I just, I want to make, I want to live a big life, and I want to make a big kingdom impact, and, and, and that's a, a lot of the reason why I launched this church called Bay Point that's now Kensington, 19 years ago. We launched it in, uh, in July of 1998, and, you know, that was a, in fact, the whole ministry run, which has been 35, 36 years, has been amazing. I mean, thrills and spills, and we've seen God move, and sometimes because of our obedience, sometimes in spite of our disobedience. But I, you know, I, I remember the, the days of the launch of Bay Point and, and growth and buying the property and building the buildings, and you guys have, have been through all of that too, but... There was a period in my life. In fact, the unease that began to settle in me was at the very time when everything was up and to the right at Bay Point. We just got into our building. We, we doubled in attendance. and I mean, just everything was rocking. So why this gnawing unease inside of me? And it's because of the overwhelming data that was coming to us. And I wanted to stick my head in the sand and pretend it wasn't true. But the overwhelming data that was coming that there is any, a scandalously large gap between what pre people who bear the name of Jesus profess to believe and how they're actually living their life. In short, it was the lack of people actually following Jesus that began to bother me deeply because that is the essence of discipleship. It's that daily decision to follow and to honor Jesus in our finances, like we just did in our giving, in our marriages, in how we resolve conflict, how we, all of it. And I had to, I mean, I, I remember a couple years ago standing in front of a large number of people at Bay Point, when it's still Bay, Bay Point, and repenting in front of the whole church. Because under my watch, the church that I founded was doing a terrible job of making disciples who made disciples. And so I had this, and I don't say that to shame myself or to beat up anybody, but that's just the fact. We had done a better job of drawing crowds. There's nothing wrong with that. With a crowd, you can teach, you can proclaim, you can encourage, you can rebuke, you, you can do all kinds of things, but I cannot disciple people from the stage, and neither can you. And I had to stare that one down. So here's the tension I was living with. Jesus never said, go into all the world and make churches, did he? So I'm going to bring up a scripture that we all know, but I want us to take a fresh look at it. This is what we call the Great Commission. So if you bring up the first slide, if you want to look it up in your Bible, it's Matthew chapter 28, verses 19, 18 through 20. Now, I'm going to look at that first verse where Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. I would encourage you at some point down the road to look that up and just stay there with it. Don't even go on to verse 19 and 20. I want you to just at some point interact with verse 18 because Jesus says, how much authority has been given to me? All of it. And in the heavens, in the cosmos, and on the earth, I got all of it, Jesus says. Not, not most of it. I've got all the chips. That's a big deal. Because when somebody who has all the authority in the universe tells you to do something, you don't negotiate, do you? Well, we think we do because we live in a democracy. We want to debate and negotiate with everybody. We don't live in a world where there are lords and servants. The earliest confession of the Christian church is Jesus is Lord. I think most of us, at, a, at, a, at least a, at a deeper level, have no clue as to what that actually means. It means he's got all the authority. He's got all the chips. Bring that slide back up, if you would, please. So let me move on. Therefore, the one who has all the authority says, go. So now, if we understand that, we're like, I, I don't know where I'm going yet, 
but I'm going because the guy with all the authority said no. So as we're going, I, by the way, I'm running in place because I was told, if I'm getting winded. <clears throat> if I move too quick, the cameras can't follow me and you guys get seasick. So I'm running, okay, so I'm going. Like, I, anything else, Lord? Because you got all the authority. You told me. Yeah, go and make disciples. Let me stop for a moment. They knew what that meant to make disciples because the one who had discipled them modeled the behavior. So they're running, okay, we're going to go make this up. Anything else? He goes, yeah, baptize them. It's like you did. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Got it. Anything else? And he says, yeah, teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. And by the way, the one who tells us to go also promises to go with us. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So here's the conundrum that we live with in the modern evangelical church in America. Huge numbers of Americans profess to be Christians. Latest numbers are 70 to 75% of Americans identify themselves as Christians. By the way, parenthetically, the real number is quite different. Four major researchers began to research, how do you, like, how... 75% claim to be Christian, but what, did, what does that even mean? They said, well, if you look at the number of people who not only are, um, they're orthodox in their doctrine, they believe in God, the creator of the universe, they believe in the Trinity, they believe that Jesus is the son of God, he died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sin, that he is the only uh, means whereby human beings can be reconciled to holy God. They believe in uh, the authority of scripture. They believe in heaven and hell and all of that. But they also make daily decisions because Jesus is Lord of their life. They make daily decisions on the basis of their faith. How they treat their wife, their husband, how they run their business, how they, how they work as an employee, how they speak, how they treat women, all of that stuff. Do you know what that real number is? Four major national studies say that that number is 6%. 6% of Americans. That's the bad news. That's a sobering number. But you know what the good news is? That's 22 to 23 million people. So hang with me on this. While huge numbers of Americans profess to be Christians, over 90% of people who are self-proclaimed unbelievers, like they don't, they don't have a relationship with God, they don't purport to have one. They don't attend a local church. They're just, no, no, I just, I'm an agnostic. I'm an atheist. Over 90% of those people say that not one time in their life have they ever had one of us who claim to be followers of Jesus sit down over a cup of coffee and share their personal testimony or the gospel. Most of us go day after day after day and never share our faith. Why is that? Well, here is a grand experiment because my handwriting is atrocious. And I am a, a, about to start writing in public. So, Lord have mercy. But I remember years ago, somebody talking about the people that God uses. They use the acronym FAT. It's F-A-T. Faithful, available, teachable. I'm going to use a different acronym and add a B. Why is it that so few of us share our faith, one is fear. We're just, we're just afraid. We're, what are we afraid? We're afraid of messing up the gospel and blowing an opportunity. We're afraid of looking or sounding ridiculous. How many of you look, like to look and sound ridiculous? Anybody? Yeah, yeah. Well, there's, there's medicine for that if you actually enjoy that. But. So we're afraid another reason is apathy. We just don't give a rip. And that, that constitutes a crisis of belief. If you literally are here, you claim to be a follower of Jesus, and you, you know that there are people in your sphere of influence that are facing an eternity separate from Jesus, and you're completely apathetic about that, that's, that you've got to have a conversation with God. That your heart needs to be broken over the things that break the heart of God. And you need to understand that the scripture says that it's God's desire that none should perish. In fact, 
Benjamin Francis, you'll see a video of him. He, he talks about how every time your heart beats once, there is at least one person, maybe one and a half or close to two, that dies having never even heard the name of Jesus. And Benjamin likes to go, choo choo, it's a heartbeat, choo choo, none should perish, choo choo, none should perish, choo choo, that's the heart of God, that none should perish. And so if we're apathetic, we gotta look at that one. The T stands for training. A lot of us don't, don't share our faith because nobody's trained us. And the D, I would just say, is bad theology. What do I mean by that? Well, bad theology would be somebody that says, um, I, don't, I don't have to share my faith because it's not my spiritual gift. That, that would be like saying, you know, I don't have the spiritual gift of intercessory prayer, therefore I don't pray. Or how about this one? I don't have the, 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 the spiritual gift of giving, therefore, run that by Pastor Craig and see if he gives you a pass on that. I don't have the spiritual gift of giving, so eh. some of you, that's kind of where you've been operating at. I, I would encourage you to think about that because in the book of Acts, and we'll c come back to this in a moment, but Acts chapter 1, verse 8 says, and, and he's talking to all y'all, all the people who, had, who, who, were, who were followers of Jesus. There weren't very many at that time, but he says, and you shall be my witnesses. That's who we are. We, we are bearers of this unbelievably, radically good news. And I look at my own life. And how is it that I came into a relationship with Jesus? Somebody by the name of Kevin Gephardt, who was a senior at Rochester Adams High School, Metro Detroit area where I'm from, came and he knocked on my door. I thought the guy was a religious nut job. I had fended him off three or four times, and one day the doorbell rang and I opened it, and there he was. And as lost as I was, I couldn't be rude right to somebody's face. So I begrudgingly let him in, and he shared the gospel with me, and honestly, I didn't understand 90% of what he said. He used every Bible cliche you could possibly use. But that was the day where I, I prayed the first real prayer of my life. It, it, back in the Bay Point days, the people called it Nick's just-in-case prayer. And so, like, if you're, like, not sure what you believe, I'm telling you, pray the just-in-case prayer. Because I just said, God, not sure if you even exist, but just in case. And here's the deal. I meant it. I wasn't playing games. I was in a very dark place in my life. And then I said, well, God, if you do exist, then like, that means like you're all powerful and you know everything, and why would you have any interest in a blankety blank like me? And I used some pretty colorful language, which I won't use from stage, or Craig would never have me come back. <laughs> but I didn't know, man. I was a lost 15-year-old kid, but I said, just in case. You actually give a rip about somebody like me. And I just said, here I am. I don't know how this works. I don't know if it's abracadabra, zimzalabim. I didn't know anything. It just, do what you do, God. Do, do, and, 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 but but the, t the change in my life happened because a regular person came and shared with me. So I want to I do something. I'm going to challenge myself, see if you guys hold me accountable. I'm going to take you through the, the first eight chapters of the book of Acts in like five minutes. Do you think I can do that? Like, get a stopwatch. And, like, and like when, I, when I, like, blow through the time or if I get there, just, like, start waving. Yeah, you're... Okay, so, but, but there's a point to, to all of this. So let me take you through the early chapters of the book of Acts. Yeah, I see some of you guys are... Okay, ready? Don't start yet. I'll tell you when to start. About four minutes into it, I'll say, start your five minutes. Okay. <clears throat> Acts chapter 1, basically, it's wait for power. Because Jesus said, look, there's going to come a day when you're going to be my witnesses, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and that's the uttermost parts of the earth. But for now, stay, wait for power. That's Acts 1. Acts chapter 2, what happens? Power comes. The Holy Spirit is poured out. You've got Jews from all over the world who are in Jerusalem for Pentecost. 3,000 people get saved. The church is born, and a miracle starts to happen. Acts chapter 3, a miracle happens at the temple. A, a, a cripple is healed, and it kicks off a ruckus. In chapters 4 and 5, resistance and persecution starts. In Acts chapter 4, Peter and John are arrested, threatened, and released. And then you come to uh, Acts chapter 4. I don't know if this is part of my five minutes. Time out, because i got to read the text. Um, is that like cheating? Did I just like negotiate with you guys? 
get you a little grace here. Check out this prayer. So all, mayhem is breaking out in Jerusalem. This Jesus that the Jewish authorities had crucified along with the Roman authorities, it's like he's back and his followers are proclaiming his resurrection and they're threatening them and jailing them. And here's what happens in chapter 4, verse 23. As soon as they were freed, Peter and John returned to the other believers and told them what the leading priests and elders had said. And when they... The believers, when they heard the report, all the believers lifted their voices together in prayer to God. Oh, sovereign Lord, creator of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. In other words, you who have all the authority in heaven and earth, yeah, that's who we're praying to. He said, you spoke long ago by the Holy Spirit throughout, through our ancestor David, your servant, saying, why were the nations so angry? Why did they waste their time with futile plans? The kings of the earth prepared for battle. The rulers gathered together against the Lord and against his Messiah. In fact, this has happened here in this very city. And then he names all the people who aligned against Jesus and, uh, toward his crucifixion. He says, for Herod Antipas, Pontius Pilate the governor, the Gentiles, and the people of Israel, they were all united against Jesus, your holy servant whom you anointed. But everything they did was determined beforehand according to your will. And now, O oh Lord, hear their threats and give us, your servants, great boldness in preaching your word. And they go on to say, stretch out your hand with healing power. May miraculous signs and wonders be done through the, holy name, through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And after this prayer, the meeting place shook. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And then they preached the word of God with boldness. And that's Acts chapter 4. In Acts chapter 5, you think after prayer like that, and they all lived happily ever after. You know what happens in Acts 5? The same scourging that Jesus received before he went to the cross, the apostles received it. The disciples received it. And they counted that they rejoiced at the privilege of suffering for the name of Jesus. Then you get into Acts chapter 6 and 7. This is where the opposition mounts. This results eventually in the first murder of a follower of Jesus, the martyrdom of Stephen. But here's the point I want to make. The church was launched in the midst of impossible circumstances. They had little to no resources. They had opposition from within, from within the Jewish community. They had opposition from the outside, which was the Roman government. They had no Bibles except the Old Testament and the oral stories of Jesus. They had no DVDs. They had no worship CDs. They didn't even have Beth Moore Bible studies. I don't know how they got along. But they did have three things, and they ran with it for all they had. They had a new reality, which was the empty tomb. They had a new power, which is the Holy Spirit, and they had new life, which was their own personal story. So you got the martyrdom of Stephen, You've got widespread persecution. Now let me bring you to the point of Acts chapter 8, 1 through 4. It says, On that day a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and note this, all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Remember Jesus said, he said, Stay until power comes, and then you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem. And then where? Judea and Samaria. And so it was really the persecution of the church that began to fulfill what Jesus said would happen. It says, Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him, but Saul began to destroy the church, going, note this, going from house to house. For the first almost 400 years of the church's existence, they had no buildings. They met in homes. Paul's going to house churches. He goes to house to house, and he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. And so at this point, the church had no buildings, it had no budgets, it had no staff, it had no programs. And yet, in spite of the persecution from within and without, by the time you get to Acts 17, verse 6, we read that these largely uneducated, ordinary men and women, women were turning the world upside down. What made the difference. Acts 8, verse 4. Bring this slide up. I want us to look at it again. Those who had been scattered, by the way, there were 5,000 men, not counting their wives and children, 
So let's say some of them were married, some of them were single. Let's say, I'm guessing that number would have been 15 to 20,000 people become refugees. They're running for their lives. The only people who stayed in Jerusalem were the apostles. Everybody else uh, left. Those who had been scattered, what did they do? What did they do? They preached the word. Basically, it, it, it preached there just means they were telling the Jesus story wherever they went. Do you know what we do? I want to bring this up on the slide because I want us to look at it and think about it. Here's what we tend to do. We witness to who? Ourselves. And we witness to ourselves about our lost family and friends. And then we pray for those who don't know Jesus. I'd like to gently and yet boldly suggest that we stop doing this because it's neither biblical nor practical. We need to stop witnessing to ourselves. Now, when I say that, I'm not saying we can't tell stories about life change and, and, and the cool stuff that happened at camp. And by the way, to, the, to those middle school boys who were baptized, that is so awesome, and I hope they just light up their school with the love of Jesus. So I'm not, but I want you to hear me on this. We need to stop just witnessing to ourselves and praying for our lost friends and start praying for ourselves like they did in Acts 4 and start sharing with those who don't know Jesus. Because in his writing to the church at Corinth, Paul made this incredibly powerful statement. Many of you know this, but I want to read it again. This is 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 20. He says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. All this is from God. We didn't think this up. We don't do it. This is God's work who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and he gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. Oh, man, I, I read that, and I, it just takes me back to a time in my life where I thought, I am, there's no hope, because I have dug a hole for myself that I I cannot get out of. In fact, I even wrote a little book. It's a booklet. It was supposed to be a chapter of a larger book, but it's called Wrecked. The whole point of the book is, have you ever said or done something? Because you know, you, 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 I know what you're going to do. You're going to go, yeah, uh-huh, like yesterday or this morning or whatever. But have you ever said or done something, and the moment you say or do it, you're like, what in the world? Huh? What was I thinking? What did I just do? Where you incur a debt that you could never repay. And unless somebody does for you what you cannot do for yourself, you are dead. Man, I, I think back on that day and I think about God not counting my sins against me. I just thought, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And He has committed to us this message of reconciliation because there's so many people in your sphere of influence, your family, your friends, people you work with, they, they have never, not one time heard the good news of the message of the gospel. Not once. Especially over a co coffee conversation or whatever your favorite beverage is where somebody they know and trust, somebody who has relational capital shares their story. Not in a super preachy way, but just here's, here's what God did in my life. And then Paul goes on to say, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. So my question is, what would happen if we saw ourselves? What if we had name tags that said, Bob Boovey, ambassador. Ambassador Boovey. This has that kind of ring to it, doesn't it? Yeah. Ambassador Schmidt. You know, and, but what, what, like, what if we saw ourselves? Because what do ambassadors do? They bring the message and the methods and the principles and the practices of the king. I love this quote about a guy who, used to, who worked for Ford Motor for 40 years. At his retirement party, he said, for 40 years, I don't think he used the word ambassador, but I'll plug it in there because it's the same thing. For 40 years, I've been an ambassador of Jesus Christ, but Mr. Ford was kind enough to sign my check. What's well, a great perspective. 
Well, I saw this for the first time. I saw a gathering of ambassadors in 2010 in the northeast part of India in a simple room. I saw a group of people who understood that it was not somebody else's responsibility. It it wasn't even their responsibility. It was their great privilege to share with their family and friends the amazing message of Jesus and how it touched their lives. So I want to show you a couple pictures real quick. This first picture is a, a picture of a guy named Ritesh. Ritesh is a young guy who is taking Kolkata, India by storm. And uh, not only is he, is he helping to, to make disciples that gather in homes, but Ritesh and a group of guys called Street Servants, they're launching, I don't even know how to say this in a way where you get it, street churches. Churches that literally gather on the streets of Kolkata because they're all homeless. I'm telling you, this guy is a giant in the kingdom of heaven. Bring up the next photo. This is a, a photo of uh, Bill Marsh, actually, is a good friend of mine. Bill was with me in India. The guy in between us is, um, is Thomas. He's a pastor in Orissa, uh, India. Some of you might remember that in 2008, there was a genocide in the southern part of India. Uh, pastor Thomas had 265 people in his, his church hacked to, into pieces by radical Hindus. This next photo is, a, is, I don't even know his name. You know what I call him? Snake handler guy. Snake handler guy. Have you ever seen those movies, like the old movies with a guy playing the little, you know, the recorder, and he's got the turban on, and, the, and the, 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 the snake comes out of the basket? That's him. He can't read. He can't write. He's illiterate. But somehow, he learned how to capture these deadly cobra snakes, defang them, I don't know how that works because generally when you try something, you're not very good at first and then you get a little bit better. One mistake and he goes to see Jesus flat out. But that's what he does. And, and he, this guy, has, has, God has used him, this is a couple years ago, to plant 16 churches. And as I'm hearing story after story, I'm like, oh my goodness, it's true. God can use anybody. How about this guy? This guy's name, this next photo, this is a guy named Toppin. Toppin? I've got to be quick here, but Toppen, uh, he and his wife were Hindus, and they live on these remote islands on a huge river that separates India from Bangladesh. Toppen got on a riverboat and was taking the gospel to another village. That had, we're talking people who have never heard the name of Jesus. We're talking parts of the world, by the way, where they still sacrifice live human beings to appease the gods and goddesses of that area. Toppen was downriver at another island, and when he gets home, he gets off the boat, nobody will look him in the eye, and he's trying to figure out what's going on. Long story short, as he approaches his home, his wife is swinging from a tree. His family and his wife's family murdered her, and they planned to kill him too. He just wasn't home. In that culture, there is no justice. There's only revenge. And almost immediately, Toppin heard God say, Toppin, I died for you. I forgave you. I want you to forgive those who murdered your wife. And over a period of two or three or four years, Toppin led every member of his wife's family and his family to Christ. And just a couple, maybe about a year ago, John Hirma, who's the founder of Big Life, witnessed Toppin baptize the last of his wife's murders. It's amazing stuff. Yeah, you can, you can applaud that. And then this, this last photo, this is just a, this is just a picture of, of a community of people up in uh, the northern part of India, it might even be Nepal. It's a much simpler structure than you guys are in right now. But I'm telling you, we are connected to this amazing family that loves and follows Jesus. And I'm telling you, from day one, from Acts chapter 8, when those believers were scattered to this day, the gospel pushes back the darkness as men and women, ordinary men and women, reach out to their friends and family and say, I gotta tell you what God did in my life. Maybe a little awkward. You're not always gonna have people kneel down and accept Christ. In fact, I think most won't. And the Bible kind of tells us that. But this is how the kingdom of God, we pray, Lord, may your kingdom come and may your will be done, where? On earth as it is in heaven. I'm telling you, God, I'm, just, I'm, t- I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. 
I'm just trying to awaken in your soul this idea that the gospel is carried on the wings of ordinary people who serve an extraordinary God, who, who set aside time with their family and friends, people who are already in your, that, that orb around your life, and we tell them the amazing things that God has done. You guys may not even know this, but I was in conversation with Pastor Craig over the last six months or so, and I began to tell him, because he was like, Nick, what, what did you do? Like, you gave Bay Point away to another church? Like, did you lose your mind? Or Some people would say I lost my mind a long time ago, but that's another conversation. So I began to talk to him about big life and some of the opportunities that are out there to partner with local, national people. And I said, Craig, there's actually opportunities for individuals. I've got friends that are actually underwriting the birth of the big life movement. It's a disciple-making, house church planting movement. One of my friends is underwriting um, the, the, the birthing of big life in England, tough soil. Myself and some others are underwriting the work of big life in Ireland, tough soil. I've got a friend who's here today who's helping to underwrite, well, he and his wife are underwriting the work in, in the United Arab Emirates where tons of Muslims from all kinds of nations. But churches are doing this as well. Kensington is actually underwriting the work in Afghanistan where two more of our big life workers in Afghanistan were murdered a week ago. The two big life guys in Afghanistan who were killed, one leaves behind 11 children, another leaves behind seven. That's 50 of our big life guys in Pakistan and Afghanistan have been murdered in the last five years. I've got a friend who's underwriting big life in Vietnam. He adopted a little boy from Vietnam. This church, I just want to publicly thank you because unbeknownst to many of you, you guys are pioneering the big life work in the Czech Republic. You are underwriting, providing the seed money for that. The first ever big life European summit is in late August, and guess where it's being held? The Czech Republic. You guys are entering into a st strategic partnership where through your partnership with Big Life, local believers are going to be trained up to reach and disciple their own people. And all these people who come to faith in Jesus will immediately, it's not like we do crusade evangelism and raise your hand and sign the piece of paper and that's it. We follow up and, be, and we begin to disciple immediately people to become disciple makers. And one of the guys that Craig met that uh, stole his heart is a guy named Benjamin Francis. Benjamin is from Kolkata, India. And Ben shot a little video specifically for you guys. So take a look at the side screens. Greetings to each of my brothers and sisters in Hope Community Church, all the way from Kolkata, India. I'm Benjamin Francis and I just want to take this opportunity to thank you for praying and standing with us and believing that God is getting ready to do something amazing in Europe. I also want to thank you for your seed for Czech Republic. In fact, Czech Republic has played a very important role in our work in Europe because it was in Czech that we started meeting leaders of 14 countries from there it opened doors for us to train in Romania, Bulgaria, Ukraine, Slovakia so your seat and your prayers are working in fact next month I'd like to urge you to pray with us for leaders who are going to come all across Europe for over 13 countries in Ostrava, in Czech Republic, so that we can all come together, cry out and commit ourselves towards a great harvest and the wonderful things that God is getting ready to do in Europe. Some of them have already gone through our first module of training. Some of them haven't. But one common goal, God rain down on Europe. Once again, I want to take this opportunity. Thank you. I praise God for you. God bless you. So, you, you guys are, are actually... Um, you have a front row seat and I, to, to what I trust is going to be an amazing movement. 
a lot of the countries that we're gonna be moving into are countries where other mission organizations have been for years, but because the big life training is so simple, what we've learned over the years is complex things don't reproduce e easily. Simple things, because they're simple, can reproduce quickly. And the big life training is so simple that, that in fact, the, the, the people who are probably making the biggest difference for the gospel in China are teenage girls. 13, 14, 15, 16-year-old girls are learning how to share their story. They're learning how to share the gospel story in a very simple way, and it's just growing like wildfire. Many of these mission organizations are coming to Big Life and saying, will you train our missionaries because they already have a foothold in, in countries all over Eastern Europe. You guys are seeding the Big Life work in the Czech Republic, and I'm telling you, it's, it's going to jump way beyond the Czech Republic. You guys are investing in local, indigenous, national people. They know the language. They know the culture. As Bob said earlier, they never get homesick. The food isn't strange to them. And uh, my, my prayer is that in the months and years to come, Pastor Craig or somebody else on staff will come up on stage and say, in addition to this, 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 this that happened at New Hope, guess what else happened? We planted like 500 house churches all around the world, and you're going, we did? That's awesome! So um, I know I'm, I'm out of time. This is the danger with guest speakers. They don't know the rhythm. They don't know the time. Some of you guys are like, come on. So let me just wrap it up this way. Big Life is a movement of, of disciples who are empowered to reach and disciple their own people for Jesus Christ. And Big Life, while it's primarily a house church movement, the things that we train people to do can be used anywhere. So I would, here's my kind of closing challenge, and I'll pray. Commit to live a big life and to make a big kingdom impact. And if you ask yourself, well, how do I do that? I would just say, <laughs> it's, it's really, <laughs> he jumped the gun on that. I was like, well, did I say something funny? Oh, yeah, that's, that was my, like, closing goodbye. But anyway, don't you just love that kid? Yeah, be a big life. If you guys would commit, if even a small percentage of you would commit to take some relational risks, learn how to tell your story. You go to Acts 26. It's right there. Paul talks about what my life was like before I knew Jesus. Here's, here's how I came to know him. Here's the difference he's made. And learn how to just very simply lay out the gospel message. You can even go online. Uh, all of the Big Life training is available on online at a website called uh, zumeproject.com. Zume, Z-U-M-E. Zumeproject.com. Zume is the Greek word for yeast. Because the kingdom of God, the advancement of the kingdom of God, is like yeast. Nothing spectacular about yeast. It's invisible. Jesus said the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. Tiny. But give it some time. Give it some water. Give it the power of the Holy Spirit. And, and all of a sudden, you've got a movement. So if you're interested in knowing more about big life and how, beyond uh, New Hope's commitment to it, how you could become personally involved, I would just say, come see me. Now bring that slide up. Happy big life. So uh, <laughs> let, me, uh, let me pray, and then uh, Pastor Rick's going to come up and close us. So, Father, um, we hear so much bad news in the world, and we hear so much about churches clo uh, closing and, and uh, like the encroaching darkness, especially in America. And sometimes we can feel discouraged and like we're losing the battle. But when we go back to the book of Acts and we look at how the gospel actually went from Jerusalem to Rome in one generation, penetrated every sphere of society, we realize that it was not on the, on the backs of articulate communicators. It was regular people. And, and they didn't have answers to most of the deep, sophisticated questions, though I'm grateful for studies like the Think Study that's coming up. That's awesome. But it's really just people saying, look, I, I, all I know is this. It's like John 9 with a blind guy. All I know is I was blind and now I can see and Jesus did it. And if we could get like this fire in our souls and start engaging, if we could just live out the Great Commission to go, just get going, 
and start you know, sharing our story, sharing the gospel story, making disciples who make disciples, baptizing them, teaching them to obey. We'll, we'll see the tide turn in a heartbeat. But that's not going to happen unless a whole bunch of us stare that down and say, Lord, I want to live a big life. I don't want to I don't want to just come and be a consumer of religious goods. That's not what I want. It's not what you want. I want to live a big life and I want to make a big kingdom impact for however many more years I have on this earth. And for me, the sand's running through the hourglass. I don't know how much more time I have. But for the the days and the weeks and months and years that we do have, Lord Jesus, use our lives to advance your kingdom. And God, if there are people here today they don't even know anything about your kingdom or about you as their king, I pray they would pray their own just-in-case prayer. Lord Jesus, just in case you died on that cross for me, just in case your blood was shed to pay the penalty for my sin, and, and I can receive a pardon, and I can be forgiven of all the junk in my life, man, if that's you, you just say, Jesus, I'm in. I, just come into my life, and whatever it means for me to follow you, I commit right now to do that. So, Lord, I pray your blessing. Pastor Craig and the staff here at New Hope and all the New Hope family, continue to use them in a powerful way for the work of your kingdom. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody agreed, said amen. Thanks, you guys. Thank you, Nick. Stand and sing, my chains are gone. Cause my chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior is blessed me. And like a flood, His mercy brings unending love, amazing grace. The words of that chorus say, my chains are gone, but let's do what Nick has encouraged us to do not just preach to ourselves. Let's share the gospel with those we know. Thanks for coming today. God bless you. Thank you, Nick. It's great to have you. Thank you. Let's go tell the story. Live for him. Amen.